Grow revenge stories. Evil cheerleader gets shown what evil truly is so I was reminded of this when an old school buddy found me on Facebook the other day. I apologize for the length of this story and will put a TL. DR at the end. Now before I became a friendly cookie loving teddy bear, I was a thin, mean little theater goth who got into frequent fights. It's what happens when you're black, nerdy, and gay while growing up in rural Virginia. I especially could not stand it when people pick on my friends. In comes the evil cheerleader. We'll call her B. Now some of you might be rolling your eyes at this. Evil cheerleader? Oh no, what a terrible cliché. But our school was a little different. You see, she was the only evil cheerleader. The rest of the team was super nice and did a lot of inter-school outreach. Anyways, B liked to stomp through the hallways like she owned the place and would viciously bully anyone who looked at her wrong. Naturally my confrontational A would stare at her like she was a bug every time I saw her. Up to that point she had only had beef with me. We'd trade insults, she'd start a rumor about me, I'd pour soda on her hair, that sort of thing. Then she saw me with one of my shy theater friends who we'll call K. I was more than B's match, so instead she chose to go after K. K was such a wonderful human. Never said a bad word about anyone. Was always willing to help people. And she made the best s'mores cookies. K also had the unfortunate habit of just letting people treat her however they wanted and not saying anything about it. So imagine my sheer fury when I see B slamming K against the locker by her hair, calling her the N word. You wanna try to bully me? Fine. You wanna call me outside my name? Fine. What you will not do is come after my friends with racism and violence. Not today, baby girl. I immediately ran over and slapped B as hard as I could. Now due to my height and ethnicity, I've been taught that I shouldn't start physical altercations with women as it never looks good. I cared just enough to not deck that punt. As B was picking her face off the floor, she thought it would be a good idea to double down on the racism. B, all you NS are wife beaters. Me, come again? I slapped you because you were hurting my friend. The hell is wrong with you? B. She stole something from me like the dirty monkey she is. Me. Again. What the hell is wrong with you? Her insults really weren't making sense. Looking back, I think she was just trying to say the most racially offensive thing she could think of without any real consideration of reality. Which is just terrible roasting technique. Me. You know what? I have less than zero fricks to give you right now. You come near my friends again and I will literally snatch your uterus out with my bare hands. B. We'll see what my boyfriend says about that. Me. Oh no. Not your boyfriend. Sarcasm. She walked away spitting more bullsh but at that point I chose to ignore her and focus on K who had a small knot forming on her forehead. I took K to the nurse's office and begged her to report B. K didn't want to because I might get in trouble too. I told her that I didn't care, slapping that B was worth it. But K didn't budge. After K got an ice pack, we were both sent back to class and the rest of the day went on as usual. After school, I was on my way to anime club, yes, I'm a weeb, and who should show up but B's boyfriend, who we'll call Bob. Now Bob was a soft spoken guy who only got cool points because he was on the football team. Peel off the football team luster and you have a walking, talking doormat who's about as intimidating as a medicated cotton ball. So him and his boys waltz on up to me, spitting some wannabe threatening line about making me disappear. I informed him that I own waterfront property on the Wish Island because I wish a bee would. His friends laughed at him which exasperated the snot out of me. Most punks are all talk. You stand your ground and they'll back off. Unless they have their friends with them. The moment they lose face in front of their crew, they become much more likely to do something stupid. So of course he rushes me. Now I've got something of a conundrum. I'm scrappy but I'm by no means a badass. There are five of them and one of me. So if I can drop this dude, 
I have to be able to either put on a good show so they don't engage or run. Considering I was extra rough, I decided to put on a show. I use Bob's momentum and I slam him into a nearby locker, putting my forearm on his throat. Now I don't remember what threat I whispered to Bob but I'm going to assume it was effective because he went still. Now what I do remember was what happened next. Now due to how I was holding him against the locker, our bodies were pretty close. Too close. Because I felt something press against my thigh. Now I'm thinking it's a weapon or a phone or something. Nope. It was his erection. Homeboy was aroused. Why? No clue. All I do know was that things had gotten really awkward. I let him go and hightailed it out of there because I'm equal parts WTF and did that really just happen during anime club. I told Kay all about what happened. She laughed because of course she did, but then a look crept in her eye. It was this devious little smirk that I had never seen up till that point. She looked at me and told me that if we wanted to, we could use this to teach B a lesson. I'm thinking she meant like a rumor or using this to insult her but no. K had something far worse in mind. It's true what they say about the quiet ones. So after a few days and some additional planning, it was time to put our revenge into motion. I found Bob and asked to speak with him privately, so we went into the spare classroom that the school never really uses. After some back and forth Bob confirmed that he was Beeksel. Some cringe-worthy flirting later, Bob and I are making out. All according to plan. B would walk in, see us and be humiliated. Now I do want to mention that hindsight is 20 stroke 20. We were teenagers and we really didn't understand how problematic this plan was on a social scale. B deserved some karmic justice but this really shouldn't have been it. That being said, Bob was an eager beaver. He didn't stop at just making out. He up, went down south if you catch my meaning. Me being hormonal and admittedly starved for a little attention, really didn't see any reason to stop him. So when Kay led B into the room, she got to see Bob's head well, bobbing and me with a contented smile on my face. Now to B's credit, she was not homophobic towards Bob in any way. In that highly problematic situation, she had plenty of opportunity. She was however, furious at him cheating on her with one of her sworn enemies. And an n-word to boot. She screamed at him for almost 15 minutes before a teacher had come by and demanded that we head to class. Later, B found me at lunch and called a ceasefire of sorts. She agreed to only target me if I agreed to stay away from Bob. I agreed, knowing full well that Bob was coming over to my house that afternoon. B and I would continue to antagonize each other until I moved away but it was never as severe. In some ways I think we kinda broke her confidence a little. Oh well. Don't be a racist punt and people won't want to get back at you. TL, DR, cheerleader is a bully and racist. I seduce her boyfriend and have her walk in him giving me an oral presentation. Never. Ruin. Your. Sisters. Prom. Dress. So yeah you'll seem to love how I write my pro revenge stories. While I do have some more good ones yet to tell. I decided why not space them out a bit, and see if I can spruce up someone else's for a change, with their permission of course. This actually happened to a friend of mine. Someone once referred to it as a modern Edgar Allan Poe story of revenge and nobody who's heard it walks away the same person because of how twisted and diabolical it is. So I asked for her permission to try and sell it in my own narrative style. And it's with her blessing that I tell you all the story of the gay brother and the prom dress. I warn you guys though. If you came here for a story about a kind-hearted, innocent ideal victim who is typically an absolute sweetheart and would normally never possibly pull something this vindictive and arranged unless in response to being pushed to the absolute breaking point. I suggest you go read some former Girl Scouts anecdote about getting even the mean boy on the block who stole her cookies. 
the 16 year old in this story is an absolute sociopath when it comes to being messed with, and in terms of how far past the point of no return she is willing to go in the name of vengeance, let's just say it's enough to make the Punisher himself reevaluate his life choices. Here we go. Upon finishing this story, please spare your fingers the effort of typing up essays about what a vindictive, homophobic and spiteful C I am. Much like a political cartoon attempting to open a Trump voter from 2016's eyes to their leader's incompetence, it's pointless your target audience already knows, but the damage caused by their actions cannot be undone. I make no claims of nobility in my actions, nor do I defend them. I'm just presenting my story in a manner that I hope is truly reflective of how much I've changed and how sorry I am on a subreddit post dedicated to revenge burners framed in a narrative style intended to make the audience root for myself and garner laughs at my brother's expense. But unless you're a newly fledged catholic priest seeking practice before his first day in the confession box, you didn't come here for retrospective repentance. So as my aunt who worked the corner between her shifts on the pole used to say to clients outside the club, let's give you what you came for. So this takes place when I was 16, wide-eyed, full of wonder and, much to a lot of judges displeasures, unable to be tried as an adult. I had myself a big brother we'll call Elio. And like many big brothers at the time, he was coming to terms with his flowering exulity, among other things that went shooting up from otherwise flat surfaces whenever Robin appeared on screen in Batman Forever. He did his best to keep it a secret, plastering Playboy centerfolds over his Ariana Grande posters, and stoically sitting through the game with my dad during Super Bowl parties, albeit through gritted teeth probably wishing he could watch a Britney Spears music video instead. But much like a Nintendo Switch under the tree on Christmas Eve you can't keep something this major under wraps for long where nosy kids are involved. The nosy kid in this case being me. Like many twinks who came before him upon discovering an alternative lifestyle from the rigid confines of toxic hetero masculinity, Elio took it upon himself to explore his feminine side with all the zeal and passion of a prophet with a message. Mount Hera in this scenario being a nightclub bathroom while the angel Jabril was a 6 feet 6 Imca trainer who spelled his name Johnny with an I. Ironically this eagerness to play up the girly shtick was how he came to succumb to the worst sin you can commit as a brother stealing your sister's clothes. A message to all the gay men reading this. Her wardrobe is not your experimental laboratory, and you ain't DR. Frankenstein. Now in my defense if Elio had the decency to just ask me to borrow my stuff, under the guise of shopping for some made up girlfriend with the same shoe size colors height as myself, I'd have happily obliged. Heck, if he had just offered himself up as a sacrificial lamb modeling for my startup clothing line, 16 year old me considered herself a fashionista with a penchant for designing outfits and recycling her wardrobe to bring them to life. I'd have been all too eager to be his guide into the world of women's fashion. But the two-faced bastard opted to sneak into my closet and try on my stuff without permission. He thought he was being slick putting them back when he was done, but I was a petite women's zero and he was a men's medium. Now had he simply owned up to being incompatible with my measurements and admitted his crime to me the first time, I might have restrained from the retribution I'd go on to unleash. But instead he continued to indulge in his deluded fantasy that we were the same size and for weeks, I'd try on my clothes only to find them grotesquely stretched out of shape, with no explanation. I tried hiding my clothes in parts of the closet I didn't think the thief would check, only for him to find them. I began sleeping with my favorite clothes like a stuffed animal, but even my embrace couldn't protect them from being warped beyond wearability. I started hiding my junior prom dress under the bed. At one point I was Loki starting to consider the possibility that I was beginning to shrink. And had I not come home early from a cancelled sat prep session one afternoon, my tutor got wind of a family emergency halfway through, this story might have otherwise ended with me in a straight jacked begging some burned out shrink to save me before I went microscopic. But fate had other plans. I made a beeline for my room to find sounds coming from behind the door. 
Upon realizing that I was bearing witness to the dastardly clothing deformer, I hid in the bathroom in the corridor and peeked through a crack in the door for the culprit to leave my room. Imagine my shock when I discovered it was Elio. To my horror, I watched him go under my bed to place something there and upon his departure my worst fears were confirmed he had tried on my beloved prom dress. Earlier in the week I had bragged to him about the lengths I had gone to hide it from the closet ghost thinking it would go through one ear and out the other with him, and just wanting an excuse to flex on how smart I was to take extra precautions. I storm in, demanding to know why he was wearing my clothes. He condescendingly tells me that he looks better in them than I do. I was heartbroken to find that the zipper had broken and the fit was horribly mangled. I went down in tears begging for my mom to tell me it could be salvaged, only for her to tell me what I prayed she wouldn't. She wasn't particularly sympathetic, thinking I had done the damage myself, and refused to buy me another one. I demanded that Elio pay me back for the dress so I could buy another but he gave me less than half of what it cost. He refused to believe that it cost more than what I said it did, and unfortunately, my mom didn't have the receipts to prove it on account of being a bit scatterbrained when it comes to keeping track of payments. When I threatened to tell her that he was the one who ruined the dress, he laughed and said they'd never believe me. In spite of my rage and fury sending me into a frenzy of hysterics, I still knew he was right. The two-faced bastard deserved an Oscar for his straight facade and even if he was prancing around in a rainbow unit at singing Born This Way by Lady Gaga, my folks were the type who would deny his gayness right up until the moment they came home to find him getting jackhammered on the kitchen table by Puerto Rican bodybuilder. I realized that if I wanted to get even, I needed my own plan or action. And that was to hit him where it hurt. But where exactly is the weak spot on your brother when his standard boy ones have long since gone numb from an overuse of flashlights and his rectal cavity as a storage unit? The answers lay in his phone. After several weeks of casually walking behind the couch every time Elio whipped out his phone on it, I finally figured out his phone pin. He always locked his room, but thanks to some YouTube tutorials on how to pick a basic door lock with a bobby pin, that problem quickly resolved itself. Every time Elio went to shower, I'd sneak in and hack his phone, giving myself a 15 minute crash course on all things valued by a typical bottom. It turns out he fancied himself the next biggest thing in the drag scene. He was using my outfits to cement his status as the rising star of the social media drag scene. I thought about deleting his account but I didn't want him suspecting me of it and tattling to my folks. Besides, he could always just create a new one and start over again. He liked drag race, pop and iced coffee, but I couldn't exactly ruin his chances of getting on the show, and in the digital age, he had no CDS to smash or switch out. Of course there was always the option of spiking his coffee with something nasty but I wanted him to feel the pain I did. And that pain simply wasn't comparable to a wasted $5.99 plus tax. I was about to concede defeat after about 2 weeks of trying to find something, when I discovered he downloaded Grinder. After my initial revulsion to the app, no not because of I was a homophobe, but because his profile and was full of his nudes, regardless of what he was into, I didn't find my brother's ding dong appealing. I doubt any sister does. Elio wasn't really into hookups, but apparently he did like sending nudes to whoever asked for them. It's important to note that he always blurred or blacked out his face for privacy, and he appeared to color in the background of all his pictures with the image editing on his phone post-production, and he always kept his location on never. I suddenly understood why he had taken to hogging the bathroom for up to 20 minutes over the weekend. I just assumed that he was just paying the price for going to Chipotle every Friday with friends but now I knew. He was basically trying to find the best angles for his customers. And just like that I finally had a plan. What I did next was not something I'm proud of but I was bitter, hurting, and desperate for payback. Not making excuses just telling it like it is. I downloaded Grinder onto my own phone, and created a fake account. I used some stock photo of a six pack for my profile and punched in a bunch of fake info including a spoof GPS location 
Shout out to the internet for walking me through the process. I knew it would really make a difference to my brother. He didn't really seem to care who was getting his naughty pics so much as how cute he looked in them. The boy fancied himself a bit of a male model and I guess he decided Grinder was the best place to get a feel for the industry. Anyways, over the course of several weeks I became one of his regulars, routinely asking him for pics, all of which I promptly deleted upon receiving. I messaged him so frequently and stroked his ego the way I knew he liked it to be stroked, I had gone through enough of the chats backed up on his phone to know what kind of compliments made him more likely to keep sending stuff instead of just getting bored and blocking someone after the second or third time he sent them pics, before moving on to someone else. I boiled what made him tick down to a science and it wasn't long before I had him eating out of the palm of my hand. Eventually I had earned a spot in his heart as one of his exclusives. At my suggestion, we'd start having sessions where we'd schedule times for him to flood my basement, sending me caches of pics he'd taken over the course of the week while I would live chat my reaction as to the effect they had on me. It was gross and I always felt nauseous afterwards but I wasn't going to let squeamish scruples stand between my revenge. Not after how far I'd come. The next phase of my plan involved my search on Pornhub for a promster who sounded similar to my dad, with a nice loud battle cry, do you guys see where this is going? If you want to back out now, no one will blame you, who was typically paired up with pillow princesses with considerably softer eventually after several fruitless searches ending with me crying in a fetal position asking myself how much longer I could keep this up, and if it was worth it followed by the world's most twisted pep talk about how I was a fighter who could do it, basically think that scene from Juco where Arthur puts on his clown makeup crying and you've got something of an allegory for my struggle, I finally found a guy who sounded similar enough to my dad. I downloaded several videos featuring him roughhousing with some anorexic 20-somethings onto my laptop, strung them together with some crude online video editing app, converted it to audio, and separated my leading man's climactic hollers from the soft whimpers. I saved the file on my computer under the codename brand new take on Oedipus. Last but not least, I approach my dad under the guise of needing his help for a school project, while my brother is off with his friends. I tell him I'm acting out a one woman play for my drama midterm and I need him to be the voice of my protagonist's off screen father. I ask him to recite a series of lines for me to record on my phone, all the while encouraging him to say them naturally. These lines include but aren't limited to I told you not to disturb me. What is it is everything alright, now isn't a good time to talk. And most importantly I finished my work so I think I'll head out to join the rest of the family at the movie theater. See you later. I move the audio files onto my laptop and eagerly anticipate approaching the turning point of my master plan. One Saturday morning, I had arranged for a session in which my folks would be out of the house and I'd be with them. Or so Elio thought. You see, my mom. Dad and younger brother were all going to the park near my house on a typical family outing. We'd go to the park, then take a walk around the local lake, and maybe catch a movie if we felt like it. We usually go around 4-5ish and come back at night. I know that today will be a movie day because my baby brother has been nagging my folks to go see some kids movie for a while, which he learned was out this weekend courtesy of yours truly, before I left the house. I made sure my bedroom door was wide open, important for later. While at the park, I asked to play on my dad's phone, citing a low battery on mine to explain why I couldn't use it. Then I sent Elio a text telling him that dad had just received a call from his boss telling him he had some extra work he needed to finish. I was going to be in my office across the hall from his room and could not under any circumstance be disturbed as I had a lot of stuff to do and very little time to finish it before the deadline. I waited to make sure he had read the text and sent me a thumbs up emoji in response before I told my folks that I wanted to head back home on account of me getting an early visit from the lady in red. Not one to stand between a lass and her time of the month, my dad let me go home. Feeling like a ninja, I returned to the house, all the while sending Elio my reactions to what we'll call his cute little peach, we had technically already started the session 15 minutes ago. 
I crept into the house, snuck into my room on tiptoes. Thanks to my open door, I didn't have to worry about Elio hearing the creak of it from inside his room. They were next to each other, praying he didn't come out for any reason in time to find me. I retrieved my laptop and the Bluetooth speaker I used to listen to music in the shower, and tiptoed into my dad's office, now making sure to close the door and lock it with enough force for him to hear from inside his room where I knew he was sending me the pics. I then send Elio a text apologizing for being stuck doing something stupid. But now you've got my undivided attention baby. Now it's time for the grand finale, in more ways than one. First I connect my currently muted laptop to my bluetooth speaker, which I've put at maximum volume in advance. Then, I open the Oedipus file and start to run it, while I text more and more raunchy and unhinged reactions to the incoming pictures. Just as we're approaching the end of the video containing the loudest yell, I saved the best for last. I text Elio that he's making me come so hard like the little s he is just in time to turn up the volume to the loudest setting on my laptop, we i i before the Tarzan like whoop of passion I know is around the corner. The scream played loudly enough to break the sound barrier. Calling it merely loud was the understatement of the century. It was enough so for me to have to cover my own ears despite putting on earplugs in advance. I wouldn't have been surprised if the neighbors heard. I wouldn't be surprised if people in Siberia heard. But one thing was certain. There was no way my brother didn't. I shut off the Oedipus file, lower the volume, and keep my finger on the recordings of my dad's voice. At first nothing happens. All is silent not unlike the universe before the Big Bang. The mounting tension would have been enough to send me into a heart attack had I implemented this scheme in my 50s. It takes every ounce of my will not to scream from the suspense. The agony is pure torture. I feel paralyzed in anticipation but I force myself to turn my attention to the Grinder chat. I will myself to repeatedly punch in questions asking why Elio stopped sending pics all of a sudden, while keeping my ears alert for any hint of a noise from beyond the door. Time crawls to a standstill. Then. Just when I begin to wonder if the lack of result stems from me losing my grip on reality from the stress of waiting. I hear the creak of a door turning on its hinges. The sound is faint enough to make me question its existence. By now I'm almost painfully adjusted to the waiting period. Enough to the point where part of me almost wants to deny hearing it out of fear of whether or not I'll react simply enough not to blow my cover if it's real. But it can't possibly have been real. And then I hear something else. Footsteps across the room. It's soft, timid and hesitant, but very much present. Knock knock knock. I take a deep breath and prepare to play one of the tapes. The following conversation ensues. Elio Elio on the other side of the door dad dad's pre-recorded voice Elio. Dad. Are you in there? Dad, I told you not to disturb me. What is it? Elio. How long have you been in there? Dad, I've been in here for a while. Elio, I am. Um, I heard a scream. Is everything okay? Dad, oh yeah. I screamed because I dropped something on my foot. I specifically encouraged my dad to say this line like he was hiding something. I'm okay now though. Don't worry about me. Elio. Okay. If you say so. Dad, I love you Elio. Yeah me too I guess. I hear Elio go back into his room and within seconds I hear a notification for the Grinder chat. He apologizes for the delay and like the putty in my hands I know he is, says exactly what I was banking on him too. Elio, you're not gonna believe this but my dad is in the next room and I heard him screaming at the same time you told me you were coming lol. And now commences what I believe the French refer to as the Pies de Resistance. I leave him on read and tiptoe downstairs with my apparatus while he waits for a response. Quiet. As. A. Mouse. Then I set up my laptop and speaker for one last audio blast. I put on my shoes and chill out for a few minutes watching his texts get more and more hysterical. 
begging me to respond with lol that's so weird and to assure him it was all a coincidence. A merciful sister would have realized that avenging her dress shouldn't come at the cost of her brother's peace of mind and come clean about the prank. I sent the following text to him. Elio we are never going to speak of this. Not to your mom, not to your siblings, not to me. If you attempt to bring it up, you will no longer be allowed to stay in this house. We are going to put this incident behind us and go about as if nothing happened. I want you to delete your account on this website and every single picture that you posted on it. If you know what's good for you, never go back on the app again while living under my roof then I blocked him before the final phase of my plan. From downstairs, I blast up both volume settings and fire up the last line I asked my dad to record. I finished my work so I think I'll head out to join the rest of the family at the movie theater. See you later. This time I hear Alio respond wait, what from upstairs, I can hear him coming down. Now it's time to kick it into high gear. I shove my laptop and speaker under into a cabinet under the sink, jam my feet into my shoes, and sneak out through the back door and hide behind the shed. After a few hours, my folks appear in the driveway and I rush out to welcome them back and come inside, as though I was with them the whole time. His relationship with my dad was never quite the same afterwards and many a night for years to come I overheard father bemoan his non-existent relationship with his little slugger. Elio ended up moving out less than a year after the prom dress incident. He finally came out via a Facebook post a week after settling into his new apartment. He blocked my parents on every social media platform and went completely NC. Any attempts on my dad's part to reignite their father-son bond was met with cold apathy and indifference when Elio wasn't flat out refusing to talk to him. For years the only time they ever met in person was at extended family get-togethers. I felt a bit bad for my dad but it worked out in the end. Elio's determination to distance himself from my dad resulted in him growing closer to me as a result. I think he didn't want to risk losing his other kids the way he did his oldest. In all honesty, I'd have been happy to let Elio fester in guilt and shame for the rest of his life. We were never really close growing up and the prom dress incident was nothing more than the tiniest of tips on the largest of icebergs. But over the years our relationship slowly mended and perhaps it could have evolved into something that roughly resembled a healthy sibling relationship had he not tried to take over my wedding planning and revealed his own plans to get a free engagement ceremony coming out party by hijacking my reception with a proposal to his then boyfriend. I tried to reason with him but his unyielding stubbornness forced me to pull the you know reverse card I hoped I'd never have to use. I sent him a text revealing that all this time dad had no idea he was gay, and that I was the one talking to him on Grinder. I concluded my message with a warning if he showed up, I'd have security escort him out and afterwards I'd tell the whole family that he's Ted his sister in high school and I had the nudes to prove it, I never kept any but he didn't know that. He might have been able to reveal I was a liar had he not deleted his old Grinder from back then. I then blocked him on all the platforms before he had a chance to reply. He didn't come to the wedding, I never saw him again, and my quality of life greatly improved as a result of his absence in it. TLDR, my closeted brother secretly starts wearing my clothes in order to boost his presence as a social media drag personality. He ruins my prom dress as a result and refuses to pay me back for it when confronted. I catfish him on Grinder and trick him into believing he was sending nudes to my dad. His relationship with my family falls apart after I threaten him to never speak of what happened. I let him boil alive for years with what he thinks is his scandalous little secret, until I get engaged, and he tries to take over my wedding and use it to propose to his boyfriend. I reveal to him that I was the one pretending to be our dad all those years ago then threatened to show his boyfriend and the rest of my family all the nudes he sent me and accuse him of being an incestuous perv if he comes to the ceremony before I block him. That's not your car, lady. So this happened around 2008. My buddy Brock had gotten out of the military after 10 years. He'd started in the marines but transitioned into the army for the last 4 years before buying a house in Texas. 
When he got out he did a variety of jobs before landing a gig with a repo service. He worked there for a year and had a lot of wild stories but this one sticks out the most as he helped a fellow soldier get revenge on an evil ex. Brock was at the office speaking with his manager, whom I'll refer to as Karen. Now this particular Karen had a lot of Karen-like qualities but was a force for good if you can believe that. While they were talking they see a young man enter the office. They immediately noticed he had two black eyes and an arm was in a sling. The young man, whose name I unfortunately never learned but I'll call Ben, asked how hard it would be for them to help repossess his car. Karen called her daughter in, Karen Jr., and had her pour Ben a cup of coffee. Karen then asked Ben to tell her a story. Ben began with telling her that he had just returned from a deployment. He had been dating a local girl that lived outside of the famous Fort Hood, not a good idea BTW, before the deployment. Thanks to her previous deployment he had managed to get himself a used black Dodge Charger, which was his baby. He further explained that shortly after buying the car he had met the local girl, who for the sake of the story I'll call Morgan. Morgan was always asking to drive his car but he would always decline. When he was getting ready for his deployment Morgan repeatedly asked if she could borrow the car but he kept saying no. After much needling he relented but on on the condition that she take care of his apartment until he comes back from rest and relaxation leave. She agreed. Ben left for his deployment while Morgan took care of his place. When Ben came back for leave he found his apartment immaculate. He pulled his car from storage, drove to Morgan's. He spent a few days with her before handing her the keys and heading to his home state to visit family before returning to his deployment. He returned again from his deployment and found nothing but trouble. When he walked into his apartment he found a layer of dust on just about every surface. It was almost like no one had been there in months. When he checked his bedroom he found his room had been torn apart, all of his drawers had been searched and upturned. He tried to call Morgan but never received an answer. He located his safe, which was hidden, and found it hadn't been touched. He then grabbed his spare key from the safe, called a buddy of his and they went to Morgan's. As they pulled up to Morgan's he saw a car there that he initially didn't recognize but as they got closer he realized it was his baby. Morgan had the car painted hot pink and put 24 inch spinners on it. He tried the key just to make sure and the lights flickered as it unlocked. While his buddy laughed Ben went to the front door and Morgan answered. He asked what happened to his car and she responded it's my car now. Ben walked away and hopped in his hot pink mess. As he started it four large dudes came out of Morgan's house, one with a baseball bat, and yanked Ben out of his car. They proceeded to beat the crap out of him in the driveway before his friend intervened pulling his conceal and carry pistol on the group. He then took Ben to the hospital. I'm honestly not sure if the cops were called on this. I'd assume yes but even then Ben said his friend drove by Morgan's house a handful of times while he was in the hospital at random times and the car was never there. Karen stared at Ben for a bit before asking for the paperwork. Ben handed it to her and Karen had a smile form on her face. She then asked Ben for Morgan's phone number. Ben gave it but wasn't aware of what was about to happen. Karen handed the phone to Karen Jr. who then dialed the number. Karen Jr. then began speaking to Morgan, telling her that they'd met at one of the local clubs and wanted to know if she was down to party that night. Apparently Morgan agreed and the plan was set. Brock parked his tow truck at the club and waited. Sure enough Morgan showed up with the pink monster, parked it, and went inside with some girlfriends. Brock gave them 5 minutes before he stealthily drove up to the car and hooked it up. As he was pulling out with the pink monster Morgan walked out of the club. She saw her car in the tow truck and began trying to flag Brock down but he was already out of there. The next day it was business as usual at the office when Morgan called. She was furious that her car was stolen by them and wanted it back. Karen, using her best customer service voice, told her if she had the registration she could come pick it up. Morgan began screaming louder that she was gonna call the cops at which point Karen sarcastically told her please do, then hung up on her. 
As this phone call was going on Brock happened to look out the window and saw Morgan standing next to a car in a vacant lot, throwing what appeared to be a temper tantrum. After Karen hung up Brock watched her get in the car on the passenger side. Karen then looked out the window and heard Brock verify it was her. She then began to smirk. Karen then proceeded to call the owner of the property Morgan and her friend were occupying. She told the owner about the car and asked if he wanted it towed, the owner okayed it. Brock then drove his truck over to the ladies in the car and introduced himself. They tried to explain that they were waiting for Morgan's boyfriend but Brock insisted they weren't allowed to park there. They argued and called him every name in the book. Brock then hooked up their car and lifted it partially off the ground, forcing the two to exit the vehicle. They tore into him until he showed them the tow order. While this back and forth was going on Ben arrived at the office and Morgan saw him walk in. She ran to the office door and Brock proceeded to lower the car. When Brock went back to the office all hell had broken loose. Morgan apparently tried to snag the keys back from Ben but he pocketed them. She began to hit him in his hurt arm and warned Ben that she'd call her friends to finish the job if she didn't get her keys back. Karen Jr. had already called the cops at this point and Brock got in between Ben and Morgan, even telling Morgan to try hitting him to find out what would happen. Morgan then tried to play the pity card and said she only wanted the keys to get her laptop out for school. Karen asked Ben to hand the keys over to Brock so he could grab the laptop. Brock retrieved the laptop from the car and as he was handing it over she rushed to aggressively grab it but knocked it from Brock's hands. Completely furious at this point Morgan accused Brock of dropping the computer on purpose and threatened to sue. The cops then arrived and Morgan began her sob story again, telling the police that they stole her car. The police questioned Karen and Karen gave her casual smirk while asking if they wanted to see the security videos. The police watched and listened as Morgan punched Ben several times and heard the threats she made about sending her friends after him. The police then turned to Morgan, who had turned ghost white at this point. She tried to try to back her way to the door but the police stopped her. They proceeded to ask about the car, Ben's injuries, and who she planned on sending after him. She initially denied everything but they already had evidence on her beating him up. She was arrested and Ben got his car back. After the cops left Ben admitted he didn't want to be seen in a car that looked like it was advertising Pepto-Bismol and planned on trading it in for a GTO. We later heard through the grapevine that the four guys who beat up Ben were arrested, Morgan had ratted them out. Brock had a few more stories but none of them were nearly as good as this one. Edit. Damn barely an hour and it's blown up a bit. Thanks guys. Also TL. Dr. Evil girlfriend tried to steal a car from her boyfriend, had him beat up, but a friendly Karen helps get it back. Edit 2. Wow. Thanks for all the support guys. I love that so many have enjoyed this story. So I've had a few people try to refute this story and I assure you this story is true. I have no reason to lie to anyone about this. Also some people are asking how this is considered pro revenge. While Ben didn't personally get the revenge Karen was the instrument of Morgan's destruction. She set Morgan up to lose the car after Ben and his friend couldn't locate it on their own. Morgan's fate was more or less her own doing, she believed that she could strong arm an injured man with multiple witnesses while making threats. Also while gang activity was fairly high in the killing, TX area I'm not 100% on if they were connected to any gangs. I just want to throw that last part out there. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe and leave a comment.